And today I'll be telling you about how to search on encrypted data using a cryptographic primitive called order revealing encryption. So one of the trends that we've been seeing in the last few years is that databases get compromised, databases get hacked. Just last December, we saw that Yahoo was hacked yet again, and more than one billion accounts were exposed. And if you look at the news releases, you know, the compromised information includes names, email addresses, telephone numbers, a lot of customer information simply exposed in the clear. Now, it wouldn't be fair to just pick on Yahoo here. So just last week, a major brokerage firm, Scottrade, was also a compromise. 20,000 individuals' accounts were exposed. And if you look at the news report, it's actually quite disturbing how this was discovered. It was just a researcher who happened to be searching for random phrases on the internet on Amazon S3. They discovered this giant database entirely in the clear, including passwords. So they weren't even hashing their passwords. This is a pretty bad database breach. And the list goes on and on, right? Anthem, a popular insurance company, uh, the US voter registration database, somewhat infamously the Ashley Madison database, uh, LinkedIn IDs, all of these companies have had their databases compromised in a span of the last couple of years. It's, in fact, it's gotten so bad that we're not even really surprised when we hear about the newest and latest security breach. They have really become the norm rather than the exception, and they just get worse and worse. And the question then is, well, all of this data, all of this personal information is being compromised and made available on the internet. Why are we not doing more to, to protect that data? Why are we not encrypting the data? And when the Yahoo senior vice president was asked this question, he said that if they would have encrypted the data, it would have hurt Yahoo's ability to index and search messages and provide new user services. And this quote really highlights the tension between functionality and the need for security. On the one hand, we need access to the data in order to provide useful services. We need to be able to index and search. But at the same time, if we do not pr uh, provide security for the data, when your database gets hacked and compromised and the content's dumped onto the web, then customer information is entirely compromised. So when we study the problem, it's really about how do we search on encrypted data? How do we interpolate between a need for functionality and a need for security? So the abstractly speaking, we can model this problem as a two-party problem where we have a client who has some database. And what the client would like to do is take this database and encrypt it in some way. So here we're going to look at a secret key version. So the client possesses a secret key. She's going to go and encrypt the database. And what's stored on a database server itself is actually just the encryption of all of the contents of the database. Now, when a client wants to search, it's going to need to use a secret key in conjunction uh, with some kind of cryptographic protocol. So the next question then becomes, how do we define a security? What security goals are we trying to achieve when building a solution that enables us to search on encrypted data? So we can certainly define a very powerful adversary known as an active adversary, where the adversary really breaks into the server and has complete control. The adversary gets to see the contents of the encrypted database. It can query. It can interact with the database. This is usually an act of corruption. So the adversary has taken control of the server and subverted the machine. We can also consider a weaker or a relaxation of this, which is what we call a snapshot adversary or a passive adversary, where the adversary really breaks into the database, maybe only sits on the database for a short amount of time before it's quickly discovered and a vulnerability is patched. But here, what the adversary has been able to do is exfiltrate the contents of the database. And if we look at what has typically happened in the last few database breaches, what usually happens is the adversary breaks in and steals the contents of the database. And because there is no encryption used, a lot of customer information is compromised. So when we design solutions, certainly we can go and try to build solutions that are secure even against the online active adversaries. But these solutions will oftentimes be prohibitively expensive. So a sort of a lesser goal might be to try and build a solution that is, gets you best as possible security against this snapshot or this weaker adversary and provides you some security guarantees even in the online setting. And a cryptographic primitive that we're going to employ to achieve these goals is something called order ravioli encryption, introduced by Bonet, Louis, Rakova, Sahai, Zandri, and Zimmerman in EuroCrypt 2015. So let me bri briefly describe for you the abstract primitive that we're going to use to build encrypted search solutions. So in an order ravioli encryption scheme, it's a secret key encryption scheme where the client possesses a secret key, an encryption key. And what the client can do is encrypt numeric values or alphabetic values or alphabetic strings and sends them to the server and what an order revealing encryption scene allows you to do, as the name might be suggest, is that it allows the server using only publicly available information to compare two ciphertexts. 
Namely, the server can take an encryption of the first message and the encryption of a second message, and given only access to those ciphertexts, decide that the, the encryption of the first message is greater than the encryption of the second message. Not surprisingly, a primitive that allows you to perform comparisons on ciphertext enables you to perform legacy-friendly range queries on encrypted data. Whenever you need to sort or search, and when you, you need to do a comparison to implement those operations, what you would do is you would use the comparison operation provided by the order revealing encryption scheme to do so. So just to make sure the concept is clear, uh, let me just repeat what I just said. So if you have two ciphertexts encrypting two values x and y, in an order revealing encryption scheme, there is a public function that does not require decrypting x or y that will allow you to learn the comparison that x is greater than y. Some of you here might be familiar with an earlier notion called order preserving encryption introduced by Boudreva, Chenet, Lee, and O'Neill. This is a notion where the comparison function is actually just a numeric, direct numeric comparison on the ciphertext itself. So this require, info, imposes a structural requirement on the ciphertext space. If you're not familiar with this notion, this doesn't matter, but this is sort of the state of the art when it comes to implementing comparisons on encrypted data. Let me briefly tell you about the security of these schemes. So the functionality requirements of an order revealing encryption scheme says if you have two ciphertexts, you should be able to compare them. So the best possible notion of semantic security that we can hope for is that the order revealing encryption scheme reveals just the comparison, just the ordering of the messages, and nothing more. That's what we would hope for. Unfortunately, it turns out that achieving this strong notion of security requires prohibitively expensive tools in cryptography, such as indistinguishability obfuscation or multilinear maps. So what we have resorted to in the last couple or in the last year is looking at schemes that offer a compromise between security and performance. So these constructions, in addition to revealing just the ordering, will also reveal a small amount of additional information. And this will become more apparent later on in the talk. But I, when I come up here and tell you about order revealing encryption or order preserving encryption, one of the things that you might have thought about is these inference attacks. So these were first developed by Navid Kamara and Wright in CCS in 2015, and further generalized by Dirac et al. and Grubbs et al. this year, which basically shows that if you take a database and you encrypt it using one of these leaky encryption schemes, these like equality preserving or order preserving or order revealing encryption schemes, and you couple that with public information, you actually can mount a very devastating attack on this encrypted database itself. Basically, you can do plain text recovery. What this says is that if I take an encrypted database, because there's so much structure that's revealed by the order of the data, you can just use basic statistical analysis, and that will already allow you to recover almost all of the elements in the database. It's almost as if you did not encrypt at all. And this sort of says that direct application of order revealing encryption is very dangerous to use, and in fact, will actually not provide you much more security than not doing anything at all. So then this really begs the question of, you know, is order revealing encryption dead? Should we even study order revealing encryption if the way that we want to apply it to build encrypted search solutions is horribly broken? And that's the focus of this talk. Can we use order revealing encryption schemes in a secure way well, that is still mostly legacy friendly, so not requiring us to make huge changes to the database in order to support these queries, but at the same time, defend against these devastating offline inference attacks? And as I formulated this question right now, it's actually not very well defined. And in fact, it admits a very trivial solution. If all we cared about was defending against offline inference attacks, the trivial solution is I can simply encrypt the components of the database, encrypt the components of the index. And whenever we want to run a query over the database, the client would simply provide a decryption key uh, that would decrypt the corresponding locations of memory that allows this database to perform its task. However, if you think about this naive solution, it provides no online security. As soon as an adversary breaks into the database and observes us even a single query, it is now able to recover the entire contents of the encrypted database. So really, when I say we want an order revealing encryption scheme that can be used to provide strong security for performing database queries, I want one that first provides perfect offline security. So when a snapshot adversary steals the database, they should not learn any information. But even in the online setting, when the snapshot adversary gets to see a few queries, it should not compromise the security of the entire system. So the focus of this work will be on leveraging order revealing encryption schemes to perform range queries on encrypted data, so being able to search and sort uh, encrypted information. The key primitive that we will use is a new kind of order revealing encryption scheme, which has the property that the ciphertexts are decomposable. So what that means is I can take an encryption of a number, let's say 101 here, and I can encrypt it using an order revealing encryption scheme, and the resulting ciphertext can actually be split up into two pieces. 
And what I will here call the left ciphertext and the right ciphertext for the respective pieces. And these are basically independent components. And the nice property here is that when I want to compare two ciphertexts, it suffices that I have the left ciphertext of one, one of them and the right component of the other ciphertext. So typically, in order to compare, you need two order revealing encryption ciphertexts. Here, when we can split up these ciphertexts into two pieces, we just need one component of the first ciphertext and the other component of the second ciphertext, and that already suffices for performing the comparison. So the nice part about this, about this decomposable structure, is now we can actually impose additional security requirements on the individual pieces. For instance, we can require that the right ciphertext provide semantic security. So an order revealing encryption scheme, because of its functionality requirement, because it allows you to compare, it can never provide semantic security. But when we look in this sort of split up model, in this decomposed model, that we can require that if we only have half of each ciphertext, namely only the right ciphertext, you actually do get semantic security. And this property is precisely why we're able to achieve complete robustness against offline inference attacks. And let me show you exactly how that's done. So how do we leverage an order revealing encryption scheme that's decomposable in this way to build a system that allows you to do range queries on encrypted data? Well, what we're going to do is the following. We're going to take our database, and the first thing we're going to do is we're going to build some indices. This is typically done to support searching anyways. So in the encrypted index, it looks something like the following. We look at each column that we eventually want to search over. So maybe we want to, run, we want to support queries over the age column in this, feed, in, this data, in this table. What we would do is we would build an encrypted index where we encrypt each element of the column using an order revealing encryption scheme. And we, here, critically, we only store the right ciphertexts. And then we also store the encrypted indices uh, under some other semantically secure encryption scheme. The details here do not really matter. And we repeat this process for each column that we want to search over. So we want to support searching over the name column, the age column, and the diagnosis column. We're going to have three different indices uh, encrypted under three different order revealing encryption schemes. So this is the encrypted search index. This will be used to allow us to search this database. Finally, we can just encrypt the contents of the database using any semantically secure encryption scheme. We're only going to rely on the indices to perform the search. We don't need to require any additional structural properties on the database itself. And the client here will hold the secret keys that will allow it to query this database. So now let's look at how a query is performed once we have this kind of encrypted database structure. Suppose the client is interested in all the records where the age field is between 40 and 45. Well, the client here, we recall, uh, possesses the secret key that allows it to generate and construct encryptions. So what the client will do is the client will encrypt the endpoints corresponding to its query, 40 and 45. So I submit the left ciphertext for these two queries. And now, once the server has these left ciphertexts, what it's going to do is it's going to basically use the comparison function of the order revealing encryption scheme to compute the left ciphertext that it received from the query and the right ciphertext that lives on the server. Uh, so basically, using binary search, we can do the comparisons, we can find the two endpoints. And now the server has learned which set of indices match its query. It's all encrypted, so the server doesn't know which record IDs they are, but it knows which set of IDs they are. And what the server will do is it will send back the encrypted record indices, and now the problem is more or less solved. The client will decrypt these indices to figure out which records match, and in a separate query, the client will actually request those uh, records. So if we look at what is, uh, and finally, yes, the client will decrypt to obtain the actual uh, plain text records. So if you look at what is leaked by this system, it's basically the access pattern, so what set of records the client accesses, and whatever is revealed by the order of the encryption scheme. So there is some leakage, right, because you learn the comparison order between the query and each element in the database. But in addition, because we have order of the encryption schemes that also leak some additional information, there is some additional leakage. I will get into this later on in the talk. But this is what happens in the online setting. So it's not like the entire contents of the database is revealed if you just see a small number of queries. But what's more interesting is what happens if we look at an offline setting. So consider the snapshot adversary that breaks into the server and steals the contents of your database. Well, what, does that, what is stored on a server? Well, it's the encrypted database and these encrypted search indices. And these search indices are encrypted using an order revealing encryption scheme that actually provides semantic security. And that's just why we have perfect offline security. Everything that the adversary sees here is encrypted under a semantically secure encryption scheme. Okay? All right, so in the second part of the talk, I'm going to now tell you how we actually build these order revealing encryption schemes. Hopefully I've convinced you that in this left-right setting, we can actually leverage ORE 
in a way that actually gives us a secure and efficient solution for searching on encrypted data. So the question is, can we actually instantiate, can we actually build these things in a practical manner? And sort of the high-level blueprint that we're going to take in this work is we're going to first build a small domain order revealing encryption scheme. So an order revealing encryption scheme uh, where the message space is small, so this seems very useless, right? It might only allow us to encrypt bytes at a time. But that we can then augment it using a domain extension technique inspired by some of our previous work. And combining these two ingredients, we can actually get a large domain order revealing encryption scheme whose security is better than all previous known efficient constructions. Uh, this will be the first practical order revealing encryption scheme that provides best possible offline security. Okay, so now let me show you how the construction works. So we're going to first start by building an order revealing encryption scheme that works only for a small domain. So suppose the only messages that you cared about were the messages between one and n. And you can think about n as like 256, so encrypting bite-sized messages, so very small uh, messages. What we're going to do is we're going to associate a key with every message possible message. So we're going to associate a symmetric key with each message, so k1 up to kn, and n could be 256. Uh, in principle, you can actually derive these from a PRF uh, to compress the key, so you don't actually have to store so many, but this is not material. So for the, uh, for the uh, ease of uh, understanding, I'm going to just assume that we have a key for every position. Now, the question is, how do I actually encrypt? So suppose I want to encrypt a number of i, what I would do is I would first construct a vector where the first i positions is the number one, and the last n minus i positions contain the value zero. And the basic invariant here is that all the positions less than or equal to i have a value one, all the positions greater than i have the value zero. So now if you want to learn the relation between i and any other number, you just look at the posi that corresponding position in this vector and read off the value. That gives you the comparison with respect to i. Now we have n keys. So now we're simply going to encrypt each slot with the key for that particular slot. So we're going to encrypt the first slot with the key associated with that slot, the second slot with the key number two, and so on. To allow the comparisons, recall that by construction of this vector, the corresponding index gives you the relation of, your, of that index with the encrypted value. So if we want to learn the relation between i and any other value, we simply give out the key that decrypts the i's position. And this is the ciphertext. So now, given two ciphertexts encrypting two values i and j, how do we compare? Well, we take the key for the i slot, we can decrypt the i's position, and that will tell us the relation between the, i's, uh, between the uh, mes first message and the second message. And we can also do it the reverse, right? We can take the second message, take that key, decrypt the corresponding position to learn that ordering. Now, if you look at this a little more closely, this can't possibly work, because this requires knowing which index to decrypt. Right? If I take the key, i's key, I have to tell you, look at the i's index. That contains the comparison ordering. So we have to do something more, but it turns out that this construction is almost good enough. And the only thing that we have to do is apply a random permutation. So instead, we're going to shuffle the slots, so now the positioning no longer reveals the index. So we shuffle, and now this gives you a secure order revealing encryption scheme. So now the key will tell you, decrypt the corresponding index under the permutation. So just look at the permuted index. This reveals no information about the underlying index, as long as pi is a uniformly random permutation. And the second thing to observe is that the right ciphertext here, so this uh, encrypted vector, is actually semantically secure. We can instantiate these ciphertexts with any semantically secure encryption scheme. Uh, it requires no additional properties. And so this gives us an order revealing encryption scheme that reveals no additional information other than the ordering of the messages. The drawback, of course, is that ciphertexts are big. If I have a message space that has 256 elements, we need vectors of lengths 256. If we're encrypting 32-bit values, we need, a mess we need a vector of lengths 2 to the 32, which makes it completely impractical. So the second component, uh, or the second ingredient that we need to make uh, this scheme more practical is we, uh, is, we need, uh, is we use a domain extension technique. And what this basically says is that I will decompose the message into smaller blocks and we'll apply a small domain order revealing encryption scheme to each of the underlying blocks. So suppose we have an 8-bit message. What we're going to do is we're going to split it up into two 4-bit chunks. And basically, we're going to encrypt each chunk using an order revealing encryption instance with a secret key derived from the prefix. So concretely, what that means is that for the first chunk, I derive it from an empty prefix. For the second chunk, I derive it from uh, the first block. And basically, to compare what we do, is we just do comparisons block by block. So, and this will reveal to us which is the first block that differs. 
right? So there, uh, when we look at two messages, they're going to be equal up until a certain point. At the first position in which they differ, that tells us the relation between the two messages. And that's exactly what this block-by-block -block comparison does. And as a result, the, we will also leak the first block in the messages that differs. So that's the additional leakage in this scheme. Uh, once we apply the domain extension, we still have the same decomposition into left and right ciphertexts. So the left ciphertext will still be these keys. The right ciphertext will still be these collection of encrypted vectors under the small domain order revealing encryption scheme. And the right ciphertext still provides semantic security. So we have the same kind of construction that we needed earlier. Uh, there are some optimizations that are possible if you use a non-black box construction. I'm going to refer you to the paper for the details there. So to wrap up this talk, I'm going to briefly show you some of the benchmarks that we did. So we implemented our new order revealing encryption scheme uh, for encrypting 32-bit integers. And uh, basically, these are the last three columns of the table. And they showed uh, the performance under different kinds of block sizes. And we are comparing against sort of the existing state of the art, this order preserving encryption that does not provide very strong security, and some of our earlier work on the first construction of a practical order revealing encryption scheme. I would like to preface that the first two rows in this table are completely broken by offline inference attacks. Ours is the first one that can pr plausibly resist offline inference attacks. Uh, the key takeaway here is that the performance is pretty fast. Encrypting a single value is actually 65 times faster than sort of the existing state of the art. Uh, if we're encrypting bytes at a time, it's only 50 microseconds per encryption operation under a microsecond to compare. The drawback is that the ciphertext size is kind of large. So to encrypt a single 32-bit value, uh, the expansion, if we're going to encrypt bytes at a time, is going to be about uh, 224 bytes. So just to conclude, uh, hopefully I demonstrated at the beginning, or I said at the beginning of this talk, that inference attacks render most conventional s solutions for searching on encrypted data, the ones that have been deployed today, completely insecure. However, order revealing encryption remains a useful building block for building encrypted search solutions, but you have to use them more carefully. And hopefully, in this talk, I convinced you that our new paradigm for constructing order revealing encryption can be used to build range query solutions that are still mostly legacy compatible. We only need to change the way we perform comparisons. But at the same time, we achieve complete robustness against the existing offline inference attacks. And uh, moreover, our new construction relies only on very simple primitives, can be instantiated completely using AES. And so we get a concretely efficient construction that provides stronger security than all existing schemes. So with that, I'll open the floor to questions. Our paper uh, is online, and we have a complete implementation that's open source. Thank you very much. So yeah, looks like we have plenty of time for questions. Uh, let me just... So most databases, the indices are very much larger than the data themselves. Mm -hmm. um, do you have the, what do you do about, do you have the same index size or your indices bigger? Uh, how does that affect the size? Yeah, that's a good question. So, uh, so basically the size of the uh, resulting index is going to be, uh, the expansion factor is going to be basically the expansion factor of our ciphertexts. So they're going to be considerably larger than what they are today uh, when you deploy them because basically you're going to, instead of encrypting the values directly, you're going to encrypt the values under the order revealing encryption scheme. So that will actually be scheme dependent. It will depend on your precise database scenarios. But uh, the way that you can estimate that is just looking at the expansion factor for the database, for the, for the, sorry, for the order revealing encryption scheme. Mm -hmm. uh, question here. So uh, does the server have to know any, any secret in, in order to do the comparison? No. So the, the primitive, the order revealing encryption scheme, allows you to, to anyone that has a ciphertext to publicly compare them. So no secrets are needed to perform the comparisons. Anyone is able to do them, given just the ciphertext themselves. So what's the com time complexity for doing the comparison? Uh, right. So it's uh, 0.5 microseconds per comparison. OK, thanks. Would the uh, insertions uh, need you to recalculate the whole encryption list? Uh, no. So insertions just require us to rebuild the index uh, or to update the index. So when you want to create a new entry, you basically create a new index entry, and then you up add to the index accordingly. So as long as your insertion operation can be parameterized over just the comparison operator, then using the order revealing encryption scheme does not incur any need to change the way your insertion is done, other than changing the way the comparisons are done. So insertions and deletions are handled very naturally. All right, well, if that's cool. it, let's thank David again.